of the reporting board. So with no further ado, I'm going to introduce you all to the keynote speaker from today, Jules Pierre. Um, she's the founder, CEO, and investing partner at X Factor Ventures, an author and a board member. Jules served on the boards of the University of Michigan Alumni Association and the Access to Markets Initiative of the American Economic Liberties Project. She is the author of How We Make Stuff Now, named one of the 11 must-read books for entrepreneurs by Inc. Magazine in 2019. Jules is co-founder and former CEO of the product launch platform, The Gromit. Jules started her career as an industrial designer for technology companies and was subsequently a senior executive for large brands such as Keds, Stride Right, and Play School. The Gromit is her third startup following roles as VP of Design Continuum and president of Ziggs.com. She completed her undergraduate degree at the uh, University of Michigan uh, at the arts, uh, art school that now we call Stamps. Um, and people tell her that she's the first designer to graduate from Harvard Business School, where she is uh, she's entrepreneur in residence emeritus. Jules was named one of Fortune's most uh, powerful women entrepreneurs in 2013. She posts at Jules Pierre on Twitter and Instagram as well. So Jules, I just want to thank you for joining us today and just give you the floor as well. Thanks, Mark. I'm happy um, to be here and talk about a topic that um, I worked hard to, to master. So I love sharing it with um, students so you don't have to take the years it took me to, to understand what networking is and why it matters. And I will say um, when I went um, from Michigan to Harvard Business School, that was the first place I realized I didn't, I didn't understand the whole game. Uh, I mean, this is a little bit, um, I don't know, a little bit sarcastic, but it's, to some extent, being in business school felt to me like a two year long cocktail party. Um, people were a very expensive cocktail party, by the way, and um, people were there to make um, connections and to build networks. And that was a foreign concept to me, um, coming from a real working class family in Detroit and um, first person in my family to go to college. And then at the art school, the stamp school, you would understand the experience I had, which was um, when I interacted with people we were, first of all, usually uh, familiar to each other. We were working side by side in a classroom, but our, cons our, our conversations were substantive about the work. And cocktail parties or what people fear about networking is that it can feel a little bit like the opposite. But what I hope after, um, after I talk here, you'll see is that networking isn't just about events, even though events are a focus. It is about um, how you relate in the world to other people and build, um, build the resources you need to be successful, um, but not by being a jerk and not by being manipulative. So uh, Mark, if you go to the next slide, I can talk about that. So a lot of people fear, and I did too, that networking, like say going to an event, it's like that guy you don't wanna be with like business cards. He's trying to shove at people and trying to collect you know, yours. And it's not that at all. That feels like using people. It feels uh, transactional. And my experience of networking and people who are good at it is that it is what I wrote here. It's a lifelong practice of giving and receiving kindnesses. And that's for me, um, how I approach um, when people ask me for something, I think of it as a kindness, and that's usually the basis of a networking activity is people want to know something I know or someone I know, or I'm asking for the same thing. Um, and to me, those are kindnesses because a career is built on learning and um, exchanging information. So it's as simple as that to me. Let's go to the next slide, please. So you already heard about my background here. Um, I don't think there's anything different you need to know. I guess maybe just um, my current role, I'm an investing partner in X Factor Ventures. We only invest in gender diverse early stage startups. And, um, and everything I've done, including what I'm currently doing, 
networking is still a really important thing. I'll give you an example. Over the last two weeks, I have evaluated two investments. One is a podcast network and one is a, um, a biopharma company that's doing a new diagnostic. I don't know anything about those two fields. I know the entrepreneurs and I know reasons why I might be interested in investing in these companies, but I would be remiss if I didn't do some networking to figure out, you know, are these good companies? Are these good ideas? Are these good people? So it's a, a little bit like a research project in my current work. Like I have to go find, you know, somebody who knows this stuff. And at my stage of career, I can usually find somebody who knows something or ask someone who does and, and get my way there. So that, that's something that I deploy every single week in my career still is networking. It's not so much like I'm trying to collect people. I'm just trying to do my job better. So that's how you'll mostly experience networking in your career. So go to the next slide, please, Mark. So I'm going to talk about a career to begin with. This is a, a snapshot of the Gromit team at one point. And um, I really believe a career is built on th these three R's. A lot of times when you're in school, um, people tend to make you think it's all about your resume. Like, what can you show you've done and you know where have you studied your credentials and that's not unimportant in a portfolio would be you know loosely speaking part of a resume uh, it is important it gets you in the door for opportunity so it's it, it matters but the two R's, they get you the opportunity, if it's a job or a, a business partnership, are the next two R's. It's not your resume. It just opens the door. After that, it's all about your reputation and your relationships. So your reputation is kind of obvious, but um, you usually when somebody's checking up on you to hire you, to work with you, they're going to go do reference checks and they're not necessarily going to be to the people that you provided as names because LinkedIn, because Google. We can find, especially um, somebody who's a little further in their career, a network of people who know them. And so your reputation, the people who worked with you who weren't necessarily best friends or your bosses or the names that you'll give, is really going to matter in a way that wasn't true 20 years ago. It was harder basically to, to find what we call back channel references. So your reputation as a person in whatever your aspirations are, your career becomes a determinant of whether that offer gets made. Once you're in the door, um, the relationships you have help you do the job. That's why I call it also, it's like resourcefulness. And I just gave you two examples. For me to be a good investor, I have to be able to get to people who are smarter than I am or know things I don't know. And that's true in every role in everything you ever do. That um, Steve Jobs was famous for not sort of figuring out hard problems. Like he's seen as some kind of savant or genius. But his playbook was, okay, I think this is an interesting problem. He was good at identifying worthy problems to solve. But then he just immediately fan out and go and talk to people to figure out how to solve the problem. So you can imagine that in any career, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're an artist, whether you're a designer, that fanning out to figure stuff out will depend on your relationships. So these three R's are kind of the foundation of your career. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but I'm gonna start talking about one aspect of networking that people most fear, which is an event, which I understand. Um, and that's why, partly why I call this talk networking for introverts, because I'm an introvert, all things being equal, I'd rather not go to any events. I mean, it sounds kind of rude, but I like being with one person or I like being home um, more than I like going into a room of strangers. And I don't think that's very unusual. I think that's pretty typical, even for some extroverts. It's not necessarily what they want to do. So first of all, when you think about events, um, this is kind of a cardinal rule for me. I never go to anything that's billed as like 
networking. Like that's, that's the whole title. It's a networking event. I've been to one or two and they're horrible because you have no commonality with the people in the room. It, if people are just there to network, there's almost nothing to talk about. So only go to events that interest you. Quite often that means there's a speaker, right? It means that there's something being shared that everyone in the room cares about. So you have immediate context, but it also can be, you know, school events like the, Michigan has amazing alumni events. So the context is really simple. You went to the same school, but that's enough to go into an event and um, already have a connection. And that makes it all much more comfortable and likely to be worth your time. Now, if I do go to a business event where I'm trying to, or a, a professional event, let's say, where I'm trying to um, build my contacts in that area or just make sure the evening is a good evening, um, they're usually evenings, I do something I call pregame. So a lot of times like on Eventbrite, um, you'll see who's attending. And if that's possible, and I just did it. I just came to an event called Detroit Homecoming. Um, and I studied the 100 attendees ahead of time because I want to take this massive and intimidating event and make set my goals so I know what success. And I set a goal of meeting two to three people at an event. And if possible, I reach out to them ahead of time. And that's a really winning strategy because everybody's a little nervous about going to an event. Everybody's a little flattered when somebody says, hey, I noticed you're attending. I'd really like to meet you. I'll be there as well. You know, and you might have done this. Um, you can refer to your LinkedIn if you're on LinkedIn so they can see a picture of you. Um, but I go into the event knowing, okay, this is my job here. I, I, I can't meet 100 people. I don't want to meet 100 people. But these people that I can figure out ahead of time might be really fun to meet. So I'll let them know. Then I'll go find them and ultimately exchange contact information if you know we both sort of connected well. And then after that happens, which might be very early in the, in the event, I'll you know, then kind of relax more essentially and just talk to whoever I want to talk to may or may not be better than the people I selected right up front but I've done my job in terms of like knowing who's there and who I could enjoy meeting and then I'm really really a uh, stickler about follow-up because it's kind of useless to meet a bunch of people that you can never get in touch with again so um, I'll follow up with them by mostly linking into them is the main thing I'll do. So back to that podcast thing that I mentioned, there's a pretty um, prominent journalist um, in Boston. Her, her name's Iris Adler, who was one of my references for this investment. And she happened to um, give me her cell phone. She preferred that to a Zoom. So I had her email, I had her cell phone, and she was really gracious and said, if you have any more questions, you know, I'd love to talk again. We had a nice chat. So she's in my database now, not just LinkedIn. I actually put her in the database and maintain uh, as well because her cell phone is not something I'm going to find on LinkedIn. And I can imagine, you know, even just for fun, wanting to talk to her, but, you know, certainly professionally. So I'll follow up with people um, pretty, pretty um rigorously, I guess is the best way to put it. Next slide, please. So how do you start when you're in school, you know, your network's pretty thin. I mean, it just is you're young, you haven't had a lot of jobs yet. And the jobs you have might not build the network so easily. So while you're in school, though, you have like this golden ticket that you don't and for about two years after you graduate, you have this golden ticket of being a student that you absolutely should use. So um, you can reach out to people while you're in school. And like I said, as you're an early grad and just say, hey, I'm building my career, I'm building my network, I'm building my knowledge base, I'd love to chat with you. So use your golden ticket. And um, so obviously your professors and your fellow students are great um, people to be you know, starting to think about staying in touch with. Um, if you are already working, um, which most of you, I assume, are not, customers or service providers are in that sort of where are you now. But after you graduate, um, you'll find that staying in touch with, I stayed in touch with 
a small number of professors. There weren't that many that I felt like, you know, really, really knew me or connected with me, but in a stamp school, there were two or three or four that I always stayed in touch with. One came to my wedding. Um, that's a big deal to me, you know, right? Like um, I, I stayed in touch, but your friend's parents could fit in that bill too. They're doing interesting things because they're paying for a Michigan education. You know, they, they probably have careers that are worth knowing something about. Uh, in the case of somebody who's already graduated, former jobs are a great place. But I try to, um, when I'm on kind of a project, set a really reasonable goal. Like right now, I'm trying to get on corporate boards. So I'm in the like same phase of a project as a fresh grad would be. I'm not on any corporate board. So I'm like, you know, like you will be when you're looking, if you're looking for a job. So I set goals. Um, in my case, when I'm working full time, I think one meeting a month is all I can handle. Um, if it's in person, but a phone call or a virtual meeting a week is not an unreasonable thing for me to set because I'm building a new network or I'm tapping my network with a request or an, oh, something I want to do that they don't know I want to do. So I just have to let them know. So set reasonable goals for whatever your project is. Um, next, please. It's really important to have a great online presence. and. Um, it's mostly to just illustrate who you are, you know, how awesome you are and, and the basics about you. And ideally, ultimately, you'll get some decent search engine optimization down the road. It won't happen right away, but absolutely mandatory. And even if you're, you know, a painting student is a LinkedIn um, profile. It should um, definitely have a good, well, I think I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what the profile should have. So I'll, I'll hold that. The, the next things are nice to add are, I would only add the things you enjoy because um, having a presence in other platforms takes some maintenance. So if you're pretty visual, which I assume all of you are, Instagram is a perfectly credible way for you to let people get to know you. I love using Instagram. I started using it as a CEO because it gave people before they met me a context for who I am and I am I'm visual too so that was kind of an edge for me on Instagram because most CEOs aren't all that visual so I always felt like you know they, that that was a nice 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 addition about Instagram for me if you're more of a news junkie or just really enjoy the news um, I think Twitter's a great place to put in the time to um, be posting and then if you love to write um, a blog, still, even though they're not as popular or Substack, um, would be a great way to go if, if writing is what really floats your boat. And then one pro tip for um, getting SEO or building a reputation for interest in an area is to read professional books or topics that um, you'd like people to know you're affiliated with and write it under your real name to write um, those reviews because ultimately people will be able to find you on underneath those reviews if you use your real name. Now, I didn't know this when I, I first grad, um, came back from a sojourn living in Ireland for four years. And I wrote an Amazon review right after I got back about a South African novel. And the, the language is really tough. It, was, it had a lot of colloquial language I didn't understand. And I wrote this review just kind of warning American readers, this was going to be tough. But lo and behold, like it was one of the first things you found about me, like my, my, like looking like I, you know, wasn't a very savvy reader because I wrote uh, complaining about language in, an, in a, a South African novel. So you should know it, it could, you know, be careful what you write there. I wasn't careful and it wasn't too, too terrible, but it could have been terrible, you know, if I weren't paying attention. Um, so keep going, please. Next slide. So in terms of LinkedIn, one of the things I really like about it is there aren't a lot of rules. Resumes tend to be a little stiff and formal. LinkedIn is not. There are people who, you know, don't really put more about their jobs than their title and the time frame and the company. And there are people who give you a pretty good sense of what they did in the role. And neither of them is wrong. Um, I think it's better to do a little bit more uh, than just the simple like title of what you did, but 
you don't have to go crazy on LinkedIn. And I like that because a resume, starting building a resume seems to really intimidate people. I got paid tons of money at Harvard Business School to be a resume counselor. Like it was a part-time job I did because everybody's sort of worried about it, but LinkedIn, it's not so hard. Um, make sure you have a good photo. It's pretty much an amateur mistake to not have a photo uh, or put in something that is not you. That's really important. These are people connecting to people. They want to see you. And keep it really current. Like, you know, the more you put in there, the more you have to maintain. So uh, really scrub it or have somebody else read it if, you know, spelling and grammar is not your best thing because it does stop people in the tracks if this thing that's so important has errors in it. So basic, but it's important. And then lately, um, LinkedIn is ranking uh, the skills and endorsements that you can um, represent there more than they used to. So you can self-select up to 50 skills. Now only select what you really can do. And as a student, you might select 10, not 50, but um, that's a more important thing than I realized. It's a pretty new thing. Um, consider soliciting endorsements. This is another thing. You can see these sort of you know, reviews of people that have been solicited. And then verification quizzes. If, um, if you're doing you know, certainly something, uh, anything sort of technical, um, whether it's you know, you know, knowing how to use Photoshop or Rhino or, um, if you're up to speed on user testing or any of the kind of um, human computer interaction uh, platforms, those would be good things to take verification um, quizzes for on LinkedIn, right on LinkedIn. Next slide, please. Um, so it's number one use is to, to search or connect with people. So I, as I've said, I've used it um, obviously for your own job search, but for hiring as well. It's you know the go-to for all recruiters. And then business development, that means partnerships. Um, and when you're in a project or a job search, it's worth upgrading uh, to the monthly um, premium level because you can send messages to people that get, uh, it's very stingy. If you're on the free version, you can send way more messages um, to the people on the premium version. It's a place to be found, obviously. And um, when you're operating on LinkedIn, it can be a little bit paralyzing to know how to connect to somebody. So I think there's just two simple ways. If you've already met somebody, like if you want to connect to me after this event, you don't need to write a paragraph. You just need to say, I heard you speak. I'd love to be connected. If you met somebody at an event, and you think they'll remember your name, you can literally just push the button that says, you know, please connect. Like LinkedIn has a simple way to do that. You don't have to write anything because they're going to know, you know, that, that podcast person that I mentioned, I didn't write anything on LinkedIn. I did write her an email to thank her, but on LinkedIn, when I connected her, I didn't say a word. She knew why I wanted to connect. Uh, but don't invite strangers that way. Don't trawl LinkedIn, finding people you'd like to know and just hit the connect, connect. LinkedIn will, you know, they, they'll totally encourage you to do this. They'll, they'll present, a, you know, a checkerboard of people. It happens to me every day and say, please connect. You know, you'd love to connect to these people. And I never do that unless I explain why. And that's okay. You can connect to a stranger you've never met before, but tell them why, because, you know, it, and I'm very like, it happens to me every day. People I don't know why they're trying to connect to me, reach out to me. But if somebody takes the time to write two or three sentences that make sense to me, sure, of course. Okay, next slide, please. Um, let's say you have um, ideally had an intro to somebody, or even if you don't, you're trying to reach out to somebody. I'm mainly thinking email here. Um, I want to give you kind of a playbook for how to do that, because that's also kind of paralyzing, like you want to have a meeting to discuss their career and understand more about their field, let's say. Um, next slide, please. I, again, this is in context of email, it could be a LinkedIn message as well. First thing is start with the other person. First sentence, you've got to grab them to know this is not a form letter. This is not something you're sending to somebody else 
at least not in its entirety, that you thought about them. So make sure the first sentence mentions something. I'll give you an example. When I was running the grommet, I had somebody who was um, actually kind of a mini me. She was an industrial design graduate from Savannah College of Art and Design, and she was currently studying for MBA at Simmons College in Boston. And her first sentence was, I love this post on your blog. And she talked about some specific post. Well, I knew she, this wasn't a form letter. Like she had to know my blog existed and she, she named the title of the blog. I read the rest of the email, you know, happily um, because I knew it was personal. I, we ended up hiring her. She was a founding team member at Gromit. She started working when she was a student. Like, but it was that first line in that email that opened the door or maybe wouldn't if it, she didn't do that. And then use some language that is um, textured and not super business speak. And I think that creative people are really good at this. You know, it's adjectives, essentially. It's using words that sound human when you're writing sentences. And then this email that I'm talking about is at most three paragraphs. It's probably two short or three short paragraphs. And then after this sort of introduction, here's why I, I wanna to talk to you, Mark. Um, it's a clear paragraph about your objective. And then you'll have a link to your profile so the person can sort of check up on you. And, um, and then you'll close with a clear ask. So that's super important because um, there's, you get kind of a spidey sense when a lot of people reach out to you about who's gonna waste your time or take too much time. And when people close with a clear ask, I'm pretty sure they won't. They understand that, you know, like when I'm doing the reference calls, again, back to the investment, I say, I would like 20 minutes of your time. And quite often it's 30, but I don't take an hour. I said 20. And if they wanna give me 30, great, but I try, I try to stick to it. And, and it's like a real pro tip if you ask someone for 30 minutes and after 20 minutes, you've really kind of asked all your questions and you say, hey, I'm gonna give you back 10 minutes. Is that okay with you? Oh my God, you love that person who gave you back 10 minutes. So I used to um, mentor a, an entrepreneur and he'd show up to me personally and he always did that. He always left early. And I was always happy to meet him because I knew like, he wouldn't blow my schedule, basically. People care a lot about that. Next slide, please. So let's say I have a project. You're looking for a job. Uh, in my case, I might be looking for, like I said, a board role. A partnership has been something I've done a ton in my life or a hire. These are all projects, networking projects to me. I've got a really important hire. How am I going to find this person? Because I can't just depend on them answering my ads for, for jobs. So, but let's, let's say this is about you looking for a job. You're going to start um, working, I call it like a bullseye, working from the outside in. The people on the outside, the people you talk to first are the people who already know and respect you. Could be your professors, could be parents of your friends, could be people you've worked for in summer jobs. Could be your fellow students, but you you want them to be hard on you, so that when you're talking about yourself, you're crisp and clear, because they already know what's great about you, and they're going to help you figure out how to say that. And I still need that in my career. I still need people like in this board search who will kind of beat me up a little bit in a loving way, not too loving. I, I want the truth, but. Um, like it's a different thing for me to present myself as a board member. So I have to practice my story. How do I present myself as a good candidate? So use those people who already know and respect you. You won't be nervous. You'll be relaxed. You'll be open to their feedback. In the middle um, are the people who can connect you to the opportunities. So that would be your professors would be the most likely um, ones. But in your career, that could be investors, be your friends, friends. Uh, once your LinkedIn network gets bigger, you're going to have a lot of people in that connector state where you want to get to a certain person or company and you know somebody who knows somebody, that kind of thing. And the last place you go is the target. You want to be ready. You don't want to walk into an interview like practicing your story. You want to walk in um, with the companies, the opportunities, 
um, ready. So those are last. Don't start with like the tough interview as your first networking activity. Practice on, on other people. Okay, next slide, please. So let's say you have a meeting. It doesn't matter whether it's in person or Zoom, but um, be ready. Study the person or their business. It's It was shocking to me at Gromit how many people I'd kind of want to warm up with and eat some easy questions. And we launched one product today. It was a very easy business to understand and to research. And I might say to somebody, just as a softball, like, you know, quell their nerves question after they'd been there five or 10 minutes. Um, so what, you know, what was your favorite grommet you saw on our site? That's what we call products grommets. And I was always shocked when somebody would say, oh, I'll have to, you know, take a better look or I don't know. It, like, it's the easiest question ever. And, um, but with, you know, essentially, thank you, internet, there's no way you can't find something out about a business or a person that gives you some comfort, like, you know, somebody in uh, a mutual connection. Here's one um, somebody used on me. I um, in the running for a board and I wrote on my board profile the very bottom that I aspire to be a competitive speed walker. I'm a really good walker. I'm really fast. I've been in boot camp exercise classes where I, it's the only thing I'm good at. Like I smoke everybody. So I have this goal, like in my seventies, I'm going to be winning medals as a speed walker. It's just a funny goal. And this woman who is the chair of the nominating committee for this board is a competitive speed walker. She noticed it was a great icebreaker. Like I have to be on, you know, I'll be really interested in hearing more about it because I'm just aspiring. I don't know anything about it yet. Um, but you know, that's what I mean. Like you find something out that you can talk to the person about. I paid for um, a lot of my education at Michigan by refereeing men's intramural football. I was always on the field and also softball. And that I, I threw that in my LinkedIn recently. And I recently had a really important meeting. And that was the thing the guy wanted to talk about first a lot, you know, and it's real. I did it. I'm proud of it. It was hard, you know, so it, like you never know what the person will connect to, but that's your job to find something you can say like the football or the whatever when you go into a meeting. And um, when you first walk into a meeting, the person's not, not really in the head zone yet. They don't care about you yet. They don't care about what you want yet. They might've just had a fight with their wife or they might've just had a tough meeting. So you wanna use those first few minutes kind of in that like more casual vein anyway. That's why it's good to have those things. If you sit down all nervous and start asking your tough questions right away, um, the person's not ready for it. Give them like five minutes of being a human before they go into something professional. But having said that, it is not an amateur move to bring prepared questions. Like sometimes people I think felt like they had to be like Mr. Smooth and have everything in their head. That's hard to do. Like what's on a tablet or on paper, you know, coming in with questions, that's flattering. Same, um, same if you're in there in person or just have the link ready quickly um, to have a copy of your resume, offer that early in the meeting because you'd be surprised how many times a person has to go into a recruiting meeting unprepared. Like I'm telling you to be prepared, but sometimes the hiring manager is not very well prepared and they lost track of your resume and just having it right there, super useful to them and they, they appreciate it. It's, it's a good move. And then there's a kind of a pro tip here. Let's say you're on a job search. And um, again, for some of you, this might not be as relevant, but for maybe the design students, a little more relevant, but um, bringing a list of companies or people you'd like to, to be connected to is so helpful because it's it essentially um, boils the ocean for people to focus them. Um, and it gives them a little clear snapshot of what you're interested in. And you're totally allowed to change that list for the next meeting. You don't have to stick to that same list forever. And the list starts out really tiny when you first start. You can only think of three companies you're interested in. But you end every meeting saying, who else do you think I should meet? Who, what other companies might be interesting? So that list goes from like 
two to four after just one meeting because people get competitive about like wanting to be helpful and you've given them this excellent prompt to be helpful. So that's a pro tip and it rarely happens. So if you do that, you'll be, you'll be distinctive. Next slide, please. Um, so I already mentioned that when you first walk into a meeting, they don't really care yet. So you got to give them a little time to ramp up to care about you. Um, and they don't want to work super hard to solve your problem. So to the extent you can come in, like I said, with companies or questions, um, it's, it's so much better. I once sent a friend's son to a meeting. He was interested in, I think it was, um, it was an investment banker I sent him to. So that's a tough character to begin with. And he was so unprepared for the meeting. My, my friend I sent him to was angry at me. And it was a, such an unnecessary um, mistake for him to just like, he just so easily could have been prepared. So that's what I mean about like coming in with questions. Don't make them solve your problem. And then when you do have an ask, let's say um, this is might be a little further down your career, not so much in job search, make the ask appropriate to the relationship. And this is a pretty sophisticated concept, but let me make it kind of simple. I worked for Meg Whitman, um, who's really famous now. She ran eBay, she ran Hewlett Packard, Quibi, she ran for governor of California. And I worked for her in three different companies before she was famous. They're big jobs. She had big jobs, I had big jobs, but um, she wasn't famous. So she's probably the most influential person I've worked, she is the most influential person I've worked for. But I'll, I'm surprised when somebody I've just met asks for an introduction to her. I would never in a million years introduce somebody I just met to her. I'm not gonna waste her time. I'm gonna be really, really careful with who, how I use the time of the people that I respect and care about. And I'm gonna care about new people soon enough, but not brand new people. I've gotta know that they have a real reason that they're not you know, gonna waste her time. Like I mentioned that one, one person did. So. I guess that's what I mean. Like it'd be unlikely that Meg Mitten's the best person for you know something that somebody needs when they just met me. That's game day. What do you do afterwards? Um, you had a meeting. You're going to connect on LinkedIn first thing if you haven't done it before the meeting. Before is fine too. Either way, make sure you're connected. And then this is where um, the rubber meets the road in terms of um, whether you're going to get a good response after the meeting. Let's say during the meeting, um, I used to show up at Harvard Business School twice a month and meet with eight different student or student teams. And the main thing I could do for those students was introduce them to people that could help them with their business or their career questions. And I would always say to them, now, when you walk out of this room, I'm going to forget what I offered. I offered these two meetings. Or I'm going to forget, you know, I might forget you. Um, so afterwards, please email me and, and just remind me what I promised and send me something I can forward to that person with links to your profile or your company. Like make this ask you have for me the easiest thing for me to do that day. Like people love checking things off their list. And if introducing Mark means I can check something off my list, I'm very happy to do it. I, I wanna do it, just make it easy. Now, let's say um, you do all that. And by the way, Harvard Business School students, I would say 25% of them did that well. A lot of them never followed up with me. And maybe they didn't want the introduction, they, and that's totally fair. But I would tell them, let's say you research the person I offered to introduce you to, and you don't think it's a good idea. Just tell me that. that that's like respect, man, you, you, you understand that you shouldn't just meet people for the heck of it, that they're, you know, this should be thoughtful, but they often just sort of dropped it, which was weird to me. Okay, let's say you do all that and I introduce you and the person um, that you need to get to doesn't respond, happens all the time. Happened to me with researching this podcast network. Two of the three people I wanted to talk to got right back to me, third one, nothing. Well. 75% of the time, the reason you get nothing is the person just got busy and your email got pushed down and they forgot to respond. 
25% time, they don't want to do it. They're not nice people, whatever, but 75% of the time they really want to do it. So I, in this case, the third guy, I just said, Hey, Charlie, I just resent the exact same email. You don't have to be creative and say something new because you already made a nice email to this person with the original request. You don't have to redo it. Just say, hey, Charlie, I know you probably got busy. So I'm just bringing this up to the top of your email. And he wrote back like people almost always do. Oh, thank you. I forgot. Or I wanted to do this. Yes, let's talk. You know, that, that will happen most of the time. But what I say is um, ping people maybe... This was more urgent, so I only gave Charlie about three or four days, but generally, if it's not too urgent, 10 days in between pings is good, but only do the extra pings twice. After that, they're not interested or they're, they're just too busy. They're not going to be able to help you. So here's where um, the richness of your relationships really gets built, though, where the rubber meets the road. Obviously, most of it's in person, working with people, people who really get to know you. But there's a very broad concept of a network that goes beyond the people who can physically be near frequently. And you want to stay in touch with these people. So here's how I think about that. Next slide, please. Um, following up, this is over the long haul. Um, you met somebody. It's it's very, it's important. It's a sort of good, better, best strategy here. You met somebody, you've absolutely got to thank them, tell them, you know, whatever I just said, like whatever it is that they offered to do. You've got to do a pretty quick follow-up in the entrepreneurial world. That's within 24 hours. Uh, you should think of it as something you do pretty quickly though. Uh, again, entrepreneurs is pretty extreme that we move really fast. So 48 is fine, but a week is not fine. If I took time to meet with you, don't take a week to thank me and tell me what I'm supposed to do for you. Better after that is, let's say I introduce you to somebody. Um, tell me what happened after you met this person. I forget to do this <clears throat> a lot. So it's important to let them know you had the second thing that happened. Maybe they told you to go, you know, read a book or they told you to go visit a site. Just tell them you did it. You know, it's not always about meeting somebody, but just tell them you did whatever they suggested. Then best is periodic updates about you. You, you don't need to do this very often, but when somebody's helped you, they love to hear from you, you know, every six months, every year. You know, if it's not a close relationship, that's an appropriate period of time to be keeping people in touch. You change jobs, you moved, something happened, you got promoted, you have a new show coming out, you know, whatever it is. Um, it's a great thing to be able to keep people up, up to date uh, with updates about you. And then the most outstanding thing you can do, but it's not easy because you have to know the person somewhat, is sending people information that's relevant to them. So I'll give an example of this. I'm doing some um, work where I live in Boston on um, trying to build some affordable housing, not me personally, but I'm supporting a project uh, for affordable housing. And um, there's a city councilor I just met and I wanted to give her my point of view on the project. And during the meeting, I learned she was unexpectedly from the upper peninsula of Michigan. I mean, it was a shock. She no idea. I should have known that. That was a miss in my prep for the meeting. And I was in Detroit a uh, week before last, and I saw a car that had some kind of UP imagery and something funny about the UP. So instead of um, thanking her by email, which I was going to do because the meeting it was just before my trip, I sent her that card. Like that card's going to hit her much differently than an email, right? Like you can't always do a physical card, but I, you know, let's say the person's, you know, really into a musician or really into a sport or lives in a place where there's a news item that they might be interested about. That's what I mean. Sending them that kind of information. I do a lot by mail. That's very old fashioned. I don't, it's not expected, but it really stands out because I, I, I happen to read a lot of things but in person I find I'm a, I'm more broadly educated if I read you know print digital the algorithms narrow my field of vision a lot so I happen to have access to a lot of things I can clip and send to people so I do that a lot again that's not something I recommend you find your own way to do this but 
It's a way I do what I'm saying here. Um, it's really good to develop some kind of tracking tool. What I just described, keeping track of people is really hard. And like in my um, board search right now, I have a tracking tool. I'm using HubSpot where I keep track of, um, you know, who I contacted and when I might need to contact them again. So last action, next step. I used to always just do this on Excel and that's perfectly fine too. It's just whatever works for you. You could do it on paper, I don't care. Just some way of keeping track of people. Next slide, please. So um, keeping track, speaking, keeping track of people, I'm very happy to be connected to. Um, I have Instagram here and it, great if you follow me and I usually respond to messages, but I would also suggest LinkedIn. I, I, I'm less likely to lose track of things on LinkedIn. So and my name's really distinctive. Everything I do is under my name. So you can find me easily on any platform under my name. And I'm again, always happy to hear from Machine Grab and, and help you out. So I'm gonna stop here. That's my book. If you're interested in a um, kind of basic guide to entrepreneurship, especially in consumer products, it's a really good step-by-step -step how to book. Um, and I find students really respond to it. And the fourth chapter has a lot of good networking stuff. All right, I'm gonna stop, answer questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Joel, for you know sharing a lot of your wisdom and experience, but also what I really liked was that you gave a lot of tangible examples and advice about like how to approach different things. Uh, so that was really great. Um, John did put uh, your LinkedIn profile in the chat, as well as some links um, that you uh, referred to in your, in your talk. Uh, but yeah, if folks have any questions, feel free to either unmute yourself or put it in the chat directly and we'll read it off uh, to Jules as well. So this is the time for the Q&A portion. Hi, my name is Selena. Um, so I am actually also thinking about attending a business school. So I want to ask what inspired you to attend business school and how is the experience like to have like the um, art and design training as an undergraduate then attend the business school? Uh, it's, first of all, it's great prep for business school and it makes you a competitive candidate for business school because it's you're not going to be dime a dozen uh, you know engineers bankers they're consultants are dime a dozen art students designers are not um, but having said that a lot of business is um, thinking about kind of a you know a blank screen or a blank slate trying to solve a problem and that's what you do every day as a designer or an artist. So the thought process of not being intimidated um, by those kind of challenges is really, really useful for business and business school. I did it, um, first of all, I just sort of noticed what I always read as I was growing up. And I always read sort of the culture section. Of, this is when newspapers were more prominent in the business section. I just always really liked kind of those two halves of my brain or the feeding those. To has, but then when I got into my career as a designer, again, I'm, I'm, I'm ancient compared to you guys and designers weren't really seen as full-fledged business people. When I graduated, we were seen a little bit more like stylists without full business you know, capabilities. And that really pissed me off. I was angry like within days at my first job when I saw that. And um, I just had to rectify it by kind of arming myself and, you know, joining the suits and somewhat, you know, with a degree that they would, would understand. And I wanted to really help the cause of design and business. My whole career has had a center line around creative people, helping them achieve their goals. Um, I was a good designer, but I get more satisfaction out of, um, out of helping other creative people do great things in business. And so the MBA was kind of like that one-two punch where the creative people I've worked with always love me because I understand their ideas, but I can, you know, make the business people not be totally terrified. Meg Whitman would, I, I always knew I was like right at the exact juncture of that when Meg Whitman would say to me after a meeting, are you smoking dope? Like, you really think we should do this? And I'm like, yep. 
Because by the time something, a creative idea, you know, gets diluted by a corporation, you got to start at an edge. But she trusted me to, you know, start at the edge. Thank you so much for your answer. And I actually looked at your personal website. I'm very inspired, I have to admit. Like you include a lot of personal things and thoughts. I feel like that's very inspiring. And typically I wouldn't thought about that before because I think it really kind of gives people more like information about you and how you think. And I think in terms of business, this is how like you connect with people. And thank you so much for that. Right. Sure. And use that when you go into meetings, like it's so when you're a student, you're sort of like outside the glass looking in, not really sure what professional environments are like, but they're just human beings on the other side. So when somebody walks into a meeting like a fresh grad and can crack a joke or be self-deprecating, it's kind of amazing and wonderful. Most can't. Most people are too nervous to do that if they're really early in their careers. But like just like if you can entertain, amuse, inform the person on their side, they're just a human being. And you have the freshness and what I call it fresh eyes that are so valuable. I mean, new employees from anywhere at any stage in their career are really valuable to a company, but fresh grads even more so. I mean, I, I would have people who are right out of school, like I would talk to them a month or two into the job at Grama and say, before we corrupt you, like, tell me what you noticed here or what you noticed in the industry or you noticed about, you know, whatever you, you, I need to know before you sign up for our way of doing things. Maybe it's not the best way. And so use that and you'll, you'll have it every time you start a new job. It's not like that expires, but fresh grads are really wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much, Selena, for prompting this conversation. We have time for maybe one more question, if anybody wants to, to follow up. So I'm going to jump in here real quick. Um, first of all, thank you so much. You're, you're absolutely amazing, and these slides are incredible, and yay, we recorded it um, for others. But um, one of the things in career development that I recommend to students is to actually take time between their undergraduate education and their graduate education to become something other than a student. So that they're bringing something to a grad program um, that, that actually is based on their experience not being a student. What thoughts do you have about you know, taking that time between grad and undergrad. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with you, John. And some MBA programs require it anyway um, because they feel like you'll appreciate the education so much better. I notice that law students tend to go straight to law school. I don't get that. I would think they should do the same thing. But the advice I would have for you is you graduate, hopefully you have a salary that's not you know, poverty, but live with a really low personal burn, like don't spend too much money, live below your means um, so that you can afford to do that grad school experience or have a better shot of doing that. And I would say that for an aspiring entrepreneur as well. Like you might find, you know, your friends are, you know, getting the switch apartment or buying a new car, but if you want freedom to do other things than the, just the thing you're in, which why wouldn't you? You're too young to know for sure what you want. You want freedom. Um, live below your means as long and as hard as you can. So you'll have choice. Thank you. Well, with this, I just want to be able to, you know, be respectful of people's time. But Jules, thank you so much again for, you know, being able to share your, your, your wisdom with us, your experience, but also again, a lot of really tangible advice. So really appreciate that. Um, and again, thank you to everybody who joined us today. There's a quick form in the chat right now if you are willing to do so um, to, you know, just provide us feedback um, about, you know, what you want to be able to see in the future as well. But with this, I'm going to stop the recording. Um, and again, thank you, Jules, for everything you've done, you know, uh, for us today um, as a keynote speaker for Career Bootcamp. I would encourage everyone to join us for, our, for a remainder of our events uh, for the week. 
um, as I've shared earlier. But again, thank you so much and have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Right, thank you. Bye-bye. Go blue.